Well, let me introduce Henry uh, as a storyteller and a singer and a, uh, a teacher in the NAC or Native American Church and a very good writer and scholar. And this is what Henry, who is Apache Nashkali is. He received his ASU doctorate in English specializing in America's original poetry indigenous songs and poetry. Like many native people, he loved school so much he went to the end. The only way, uh, I don't know this Apache word, Gaje, the great crow, would let him stay in school uh, is, is, is that he would have to teach about songs and stories and write poems. So he is currently turning all that songs, stories, poems, into his first book entitled uh, Peyote Amer in Americana, Song, Story, People, that will be published by the University of Arizona Press uh, pretty, so pretty soon. Okay, that's enough about Henry. Let's hear his poetry. Please welcome, welcome Henry Quintero. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna thank the powers that be. I wanna thank E.E. E. Doy for bringing me here and letting me see the way in the maze. And, and, uh, uh, Ahie, thank you. Uh, I'm really, uh, really, really just happy to be here on Autumn Land and because um, I got my, my PhD on Autumn Land. Um, Um, I'd like to read you a, a few poems um, in the spirit of uh, um, recognizing that we've uh, paid a cost, we've, uh, we've uh, we paid our dues, um, as they say. Um, and it's, it's Veterans Day, as, as, as uh, a few people uh, pointed out. Maybe I should read from my phone first, because I don't have internet up here, and I plug these poems in first. So I'm going to switch up. I was going to read you a couple veterans' poems before. I used to travel around with uh, an old man who uh, was Pawnee, Shawnee, Lenape. He was pretty well known for the Native American country. He, he went to uh, the uh, uh, United Nations Indian Council. His name was Bill Thomas. He always used to tell me to write poems about them. So I'm going to back up a little later and I'll read you a couple veterans' poems that I wrote in Washington, D.C. when we put up teepees over there. I learned all kinds of good things from Bill Thomas, like, you don't take the bus. Uncle Bill, don't take the bus. You don't take the bus, nephew. So um, those were some of the things I learned while I was on the road. Um, and then, you know, I, I really have to mention to uh, all the kids here and all, all, all of my fellow, to, today is National Res Out Day, so I hope you guys are representing. Um, so I just wanted to mention that too. and. and with that, I wanted to also um, really take the time to uh, claim, our, claim our power. That, um, today is National Res Out Day, and it's also the day that we recognize what we've taken and what we've done. And what people don't know is OK is the first international word. And it is also the first international word that happens to be from an indigenous language from right here in the United States. It, comes from Oki, meaning it's all good. So I travel around a lot, you know, all over in California, a lot of hippies, man, a lot of hippies. And they come into meetings and stuff like that, and, you know, they do silly things, like they, they honor, like, the person that put on the ceremony, they get a bunch of leaves, and they go, here, I picked all these leaves. Great, that really helped out with the firewood and the meal and the chuma and all that, man. You really helped out with all these leaves. Yeah, I have a lot of gratitude for that. Man, I got so sick of that word, gratitude. 
And then I started thinking about the words like, like how do, well, okay is a native word. We got everybody using that all over the world. Heck, I was up in the Himalayas. I saw this little Indian guy, red dot Indian, not feather Indian. He's like, okay. He's like, wow, they know our language way up here. So then I started thinking, man, this is the time. Let's like, sapo, sapo, thank you. All right, we started, got to start using our words more all the time, man. So I started thinking, what kind of words could I use in Apache that like would start, everybody would start using it, like surfers would start using it, yeah, skaters start using it, motorcycle guys start, oh, shit, I, I am a motorcycle guy, never mind. So I wrote about this word gratitude. And so usually I got one of my brothers, he plays a water drum, Apache drum, and so we kind of sing this, but I'm just gonna kind of poem it out for you right now. It's called gratitude. Gratitude is a word for milky whitewashed hipsters who steal from each other and talk about being around people of color, white face covered in the tailings of earth. A shulk, Apache, it is honest through the action. It comes from a relation of elements. Gratitude is a Roman word. Middle age, played, said a la Edward Said Omar by French missionaries and soldiers to teach the people of the Congo to say gratitude for losing their hands and feet to slow railroad work, to color Belgian chocolate with blood diamonds. Gratitude is the color of blood in a toilet of spring water. Gratitude is a language for sheep and for the keepers of the boxes on the hill. Paint it cha, and that is the color of my gratitude. Some of you guys who speak to Ned, you might know what cha is, but. Gratitude is the, a language for shit. Oh, I read that. At least with shit, you can grow food. Gratitude is for puppies teenagers and crushes. Gratitude is for people to gloat and hold over even when they're serving up portions of homeless or helpless or cast out. Gratitude is for four sermons for be before soup kitchens. Gratitude is for whores of darker skin on French crusades to coin and glory their bodies. Commodity, whole soul to the baby white Jesus with the long blonde hair. Somewhere between the star and six points in a crescent moon and Venus rising, someone forgot all the nappy hair, forgot the reed boats floating, dragons floating to a land of people of red earth, and slowly, Kinder became kind. Gratis showed up <clears throat> for after dinner mints in parking spaces, and gratitude became a way for hipsters of all the rainbow to politely say, I got mine. So Shushvito, the bear who took care of the water, realized the work around his forearms and shook them off for the world and growled, a shook. I am thankful for my work. I am thankful of this walk. Scraped hard on the hard pan of deadpan next to the bones of cliches and buried the word in the abundance of twists and markings that previous failed spirit Bah, the coyote he howled at the passing, then yipped in gratitude for being able to save a lot on his life, his insurance like breath mints, like parking spaces, and the no harm, no foul innocence of fortune cookies. Gratitude became free for all who screamed. Yeah, so I, 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 I feel the resistance as well. Um, I, I, uh, I really didn't think that there was a place for me in, in academics. And, and so it came all the way around. And, and uh, we have this Red Ink magazine that has helped sponsor this event. And, and I really want to really uh, invite all of you here at Baba Kivri High School. We're going to have a, a benefit reading coming up in Tempe. We don't know if it's going to be at the university or we're going to have a venue near the university, but it's going to be a community reading. We're going to try and get uh, the high school from uh, White Mountain and Sibiki High to come too, and we'd, we'd like to invite all the future writers to come down there and, and, and artists as well and, and present your, your beauty, your hajoni here. 
So um, this is an older war poem. This is, uh, this is something that I wrote for an uncle of mine uh, growing up. It's from uh, this old chapbook that they, pa they published of mine a long time ago. It's called uh, Sutra 1945. It's kind of a, a love poem. It's kind of uh, figuring out that you can, you can settle up, you can uh, put things down for a while. Sutra 1945. When I stepped on the ship at Long Beach, I had nothing except my empty camera. I had sold the Nippon pistols. I had sold the three flags, the rising sun. I'd even sold the two surrendered samurai swords that I traded for a picture of Hiroshima. Now, as I walk through the cheering families, it's comforting that all I can show my family is an empty camera and a roll of bills. I always want the Pacific to be foreign to them. The cabbie cries, hey, corporal, where you want to go? And I tell him, Santa Rita, New Mexico. He just laughs and he says, I'll take you as far as Union Station. Getting there, I miss the last train and wander through Olvera, across Chinatown, the red-lit tattoo parlors and mile-long bars off Broadway, turning on eight, turning towards the neon flashing over the awnings of the Embassy Hotel on Grand. I could be in any city in the world and still this hotel with a red lobby and thick polished mirrors, this hotel with teak, paneling and thin rooms with small sinks and bad showers. This is the hotel where you hear the sobs of soldiers while they rub at the tattoo of deep Indian blue and lipstick red, that to the tattoo of their girlfriend's name covered in witch hazel. This is the hotel where you hear the grunts and moans of whores who whisper that they will pretend to be anybody. This hotel where you hear the wrinkle of money against the pressed Flemish lace never worn long enough to soften along the folds of the body as women sift back into the night. This is the hotel where you get up in the morning tired with the faint smell of sex in the air lingering with the dream tonight as I hold Linda, my face flushed hard against her soft fawn breasts. I feel the, her cross of gold and rhinestones imprinting the shadow of her faith upon my cheek. There is a hunger that neither of us can satisfy with bread. Two, when she left, there was nothing for me. I left the room, the hotel, my duffel bag of general issue clothes that I would never wear again. Walking down 8th, passing warehouse after warehouse filled with fabrics and fruits and men stuffing shuffling back and forth like bugs, their forklifts carrying slabs of beef, unloading trucks filled with boxes of cans of God knows what, standing on the tracks waiting for the hum of the first freight train. Heading east, I took the first open boxcar, catch the handle and lift myself into the empty cargo womb. There is only me, the darkness, the paddle of wheels on iron slats. When I was young, my Theo Rapino would sing to me me to sleep with that haunting voice of his Franciscan seminary singing that all God's creatures sleep at night and how a child will believe. When I was seven, Rapino placed me on his lap while he sat on one of the pigskin and aspen chairs that we kept out on the patio until late spring. He opened his Vargas cigar box and, placed, and painted postcards of Granada and the Alhambra in my hands. Here, he said, here is the finest house that you will ever see, Pedrito. And I looked deep into those stenciled watercolors, ran my hand gently across the coarse webbing of that paperboard, imagining each tie weave of the parchment was a single Islamic tile, the whole mass of them running over and along the domes and pinnacles, blue and gold tiles as lucid as water encased within walls, the fountains that they created. One postcard was of the inside of the Alhambra, Within, the watercolor stenciled into the paper of the fabric women dressed in, the, in black stared at the walls and up into the ceiling, their lips almost moving in soft whispers. And what they saw, I looked up into my Theo's pockmarked face and I asked what they were doing. And he said, they're reading the Bible, son. I never went to Spain. I never went to the Alhambra, but I saw a mosque in Mindanao, the way the top opened up, an eggshell, a hand-glazed tile shattered, hanging in the trees, and people like ceramic nails. 
I watched the son of a Sultan Joffrey's pick his teeth clean with one of those pieces of tile, cutting his gums, blood sweating over the white enamel like a fine oil, honing up the burr on the razor. He ran a comb filled with bahi oil through his hair. He shaved his head and eyebrows clean. Singing, Ramat helped him wrap him in wet leather and fence wire. Ramat held him, handed him a kris. Jaffrey smiled, cradled it against his chest. The son that he would never touch. The handle that his father's grandfather carved from horn and silver. Singing his son's father's grandfather's name in all the name of that cleaver. Naga Sarsa, Naga Sarsa. In the Batangas, I saw the smiths work steel. It reminded me of my father shoeing horses, the click, clip, flip of the ballet song, whispering what the hammer told the steel and what the steel told the anvil, the way they tested each one, the empu driving each blade through a coin. Later, checking the blade for Mars, I remember how easy it was for the knife I bought you to pass through the peso. And I remember how hard it was to say, I love you. The hills across Arizona, like waves of the Chiricahuas, the edge of the crease. Nagasaki is like the morning light in my eyes. With the smelter, Lordsburg could never be a ship. The desert, Lordsburg could never be a jungle. And with the, the keeping voices murmured, Lordsburg could never be Los Angeles. Down Bullard, I smell the early morning cedar burning the tortillas, the bacon, the eggs and beans lifting each window in the morning hours. It's Saturday, no church, no work, every kitchen alive with the music of pans and grease popping along the first morning's greetings, the screen's doors weeping with every child that runs through into the yard. And here, four blocks from my family's house, I can almost hear the voice of my Theo. I know how desperately we all need to be loved and to love. When Christ, that man, said that one does not live by bread alone, he spoke of a hunger. It was not of a hunger for beans, tortillas. It was not for a hunger of the body. He spoke of a hunger that began deep down in the very depth of my heart. He spoke of a need as vital as breath. He spoke of my hunger for love. And I was no longer weak or faint. My shoulders lifted as my mother's dog balked in disapproval as I opened the gate. And I wished that my camera had film to capture the tulips under the willow. I remember the innocence of my nephews, whom I had never met and they, as they dug for worms in the compost pile. To capture the look of my father's cataract eyes swelling with tears as I handed him the knife, I would no longer turn inward, looking out, I would steady my camera in front of the church, the branches of the apricots bowing with the weight of the blossoms, and, the, and on the count of one, two, three, looking into each other's eyes, brown, whole, and bright, like summer melons, hands weaving together like the vines of grapes, her dress is fresh and white as those blossoms in his uniform. He is green and tall as a pine, and on the hills behind our house, their skin dark as the land, hair as the night, as the one that will surround them, as they love, whisper, holding fast to the water within them, waiting for the days to come. Here, now, within the edges of these pieces of paper, glossy with images, I have found my garden. So. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henry.